Hello, hello, everyone. Um, well, I would like to welcome you to our monthly uh, seminar, uh, the Debate Key CV Live. Uh, today, um, I'm going to teach you some special hint on the interpretation of the karate duplex and the TCD studies. Uh, my name is Joel Gurami. Um, if you would like to have uh, any questions, uh, text to us, uh, please text DeBakey to the number 37607 or uh, uh, by the web, uh, you can go to the website pollev.com and please enter DeBakey and um, any questions are welcomed and also we would like to um, see any suggestions and anything you would like to hear in the future. First, I would like to uh, thank everybody who joined us on our annual uh, West School Ultrasound Masterclass, all the 3,200 people who uh, joined and uh, viewed our lectures. Um, thank you, and uh, see you next year. Uh, today, um, I would like to reverse engineer a TCD interpretation class, and uh, for the special occasion, I don't have any boring slides. I would rather run a simulation how to change uh, TCD signals, and uh, after that, uh, we'll review some karate cases live. So these are not uh, uh, prepared PowerPoint, so we'll see how the live action is going to go. This is truly DeBakey CV Live. First, I would like to introduce you to a TCD simulator. Uh, this is a special thanks to Dr. Rune Elslit who built the first TCD. And uh, what you see on my screen is a uh, simulator that it's, uh, allows me to control uh, and give you a signal at 50 millimeter depth from a middle cerebral artery. Uh, this is a gorgeous, normal middle cerebral artery signal. You see a beautiful upstroke. You see the aortic notch uh, separating the systole and diastole. And you see a low resistance signal. <clears throat> so uh, with a mean flow velocity of 63. I want you to keep your eye on this signal while I'm compressing the carotid. By compressing the carotid, my systolic upstroke disappears. So what you see here, that the blunted signal is a straight result of the blockage, what we have uh, in the carotid compression. And if I'm listening to my middle cerebral artery signal, now I can go to the ACA and to see if I have a reversed ACA. And you can see the ACA is reversed. So for a moment, I'm going to uh, uncompress my carotid. And this is the same situation when we do a carotid endotrectomy and you release uh, the clamp. The ACA goes back to the anterograde fashion. And again, just one more time, if I put a clamp on a carotid or compress it, here's your reverse ACA signal. So again, the direction is coming towards my probe, positive and negative, and that's how the simple uh, single uh, spectrum uh, waveform going to look like. And I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult and I'm going to take out my ACOM. So again, if I don't have anterior communicator artery, uh, we have some collaterals providing some flow, but an anterograde fashion. Uh, the results of that, because I still have my PCOM, uh, the posterior communicating artery, uh, my signal is more blunted. So I want you to pay attention if I take back the ACA, that's the improved collaterals. So the improved collateralization, I think, in the ACA can be studied. Now I'm going to take out the posterior communicating artery, and I'm going to take out the anterior communicating, and this is when you need to shunt, because you don't have any flow. There's no posterior communicator, and the minimal flow you may receive is maybe coming from your ophthalmic. So this is the warning of the game. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put my ACOM, and definitely my PCOM back as well, and I'm going to release and you see a hyperemic flow. So that hyperemia is again, we see it uh, when you uncompress the carotid, and this way you see the flow improvement, but again, by autoregulation goes back to the nice normal base. Um, the other beauty of this, uh, uh, that you can really go out all the way to the M2 branches, any of the wide dots, uh, you can really see uh, the flow improvement. And again, with the right mouse click, you can generate uh, me a bile vasospasm. I can uh, really see that uh, 
in the background I have an increased velocity and if I'm going closer that's my increased velocity and that's my vasospasm and the increased velocity in the middle cerebral artery. I'm going to make it even more severe. I need to increase my scale for that one. And you can hear the sound. So I think the one part of the simulator is really to see the waveform and study the waveforms, but also these sounds are real. When you sound, uh, that is the high pitch uh, stenotic sound. Um, again, uh, it means more than just uh, looking at the number alone. Um, going back to the normal flow. So this is your nice, calm, um, normal flow in the middle cerebral artery. Um, the other fun part um, I wanted to show you is how does it look like the vertebral now? This is my vertebral artery. And uh, quite often we really don't notice those slice changes what you see on the vertebral artery. I'm insonating now um, at the depth of uh, 53 and the signal is going away from my probe. And right now I'm going to occlude my subclavian on the left side. And what you see here, I have a total reversal of flow now. But with this reverse flow, you see high resistance because the, this flow is going to feed the arm, no longer needs low resistance feeding the brain. And again, I'm just going to take out the occlusion and you're going to see a normal low resistance anti-grade flow to the vertebral artery. If I'm going to uh, play the same here, I can do the 50% stenosis when you see the alternating flow pattern. And uh, again, in systole, you already have a reverse flow pattern, but when you go to the 75% stenosis, you're really going to see uh, more spikes in the retrograde fashion. And this is just the incomplete steel. Um, and again, that tells you that the subclavian is still open. In a moment, when you have a subclavian totally occluded, everything is retrograde and you don't have alternating flow anymore. So that's maybe another hint of uh, how you can interpret these studies. I am going to make it a normal flow now and this is your vertebral artery and again the same uh, you can play as uh, changing the uh, depth for the basilar artery and you can also mimic uh, any stenosis uh, we would like to see and also I think uh, Here's your occlusion signal, it's not as fancy. Um, I just wanna show you one more th signal here. This is your ophthalmic. So when your ophthalmic artery is the only vessel, when you see a high resistance pattern, when your carotid is open. Now I'm going to occlude your carotid. Mm, not the vertebral, sorry. I wanted to occlude your carotid here. I'm just going to close it with this. And now you see a retrograde ophthalmic artery because my carotid was occluded. So I think this is where uh, you can really practice how the anterograde high resistance ophthalmic artery changing to low resistance reverse ophthalmic artery. Again, it's not enough just to direction change, but you need to see uh, the resistance change as well. I am going to recanalize my carotid and the reverse ophthalmic as my collateral became uh, a normal anterograde ophthalmic with high resistance flow pattern. So this was my TCD. Uh, interpretation and again just going back to a normal MCA signal and a sound and uh, just uh, the take home message that is really simple to remember the systolic upstroke and if the systolic upstroke is missing again you need to think about that uh, proximal obstruction and you need to go proximal proximal to find where is that uh, 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 obstruction is. I know I'm just going to show you one more time how the blunted signal becomes a normal low resistance middle cerebratory signal. I would like to check quickly the questions. Um, the first question is, can you talk about the difficulty diagnosing paradoxical embolism? 
Okay, uh, is intracranial stenosis less common in Asian patients than diabetics? So let's start with the second one. Um, the Asian population, they definitely have more intracranial disease uh, why uh, uh, the European uh, white uh, uh, population where have more carotid disease. So the Asian population, uh, uh, they intend to have more intracranial disease while the carotid is clean. Um, so definitely the uh, uh, TCD would be a very important tool uh, for the uh, uh, for the stroke prevention, and I think uh, one of our uh, unique way of finding uh, the moya moya and those really severe intracranial disease in the Asian populations. The other question was, um, and what all the incidence of TCD useful in stroke prevention? Um, so TCD um, has uh, four different billing codes. Uh, we have a diagnostic TCD. Uh, the diagnostic TCD uh, through the ophthalmic artery, through the temporal bone window, and through the vertebral basilar system does an intracranial assessment with 20 different measurements throughout the intracranial circulation. And again, these are, I will say that it's a conjunction uh, to a carotid duplex because the carotid, uh, really able to see the carotid uh, to the jaw, but the carotid artery doesn't end at the jaw, so it continues towards the brain. And with the TCD, you can really see the uh, uh, intracranial vessels. And, and again, when you study the end organ, you really would like to see uh, the intracranial flow. So this is where I would say TCD is a better prevention tool than the carotid uh, for the end organ for the brain uh, uh, assessment and examination. If you have more than 50% carotid disease, that will uh, bring into the second TCD test, which is the vasomotor reactivity. And uh, with a simple breath hold, you're able to see how much collateralization you have and how much vasomotor risk, uh, reserve you have intracranially to really compensate for that uh, carotid stenosis. But also the behind an intracranial stenosis, you can do the same assessment in a distal blood vessel. Uh, the next one would be my PFO. Uh, uh, the PFO for first, we had an age limit of 65 to looking for uh, the one of the questions was the paradoxical embolism. And with cryptogenic stroke, we found that uh, in young individuals, they have definitely higher incidence of PFOs with TIN stroke uh, symptoms. And it's a really simple task because um, the person just sitting, you start a quick IV and uh, again, you only monitored for a minute. So the whole test with starting an IV and doing a PFO test, it's done with less than a, uh, 10 minutes, I would say five minutes. And with that, uh, you can really screen for any PFO intracranial, but also you can find some extracranial shunts uh, as uh, we quite frequently find it in our um, uh, liver transplant patients because there's some hepatopulmonary shunt. Uh, and going back to the first question about the uh, uh, cryptogenic and again embolization, we found the bilateral uh, middle cerebral artery monitoring, for example, going to help us to differentiate if you have a carotid disease versus a uh, aortic disease or something more central. In a moment, you have uh, something coming from the heart or from the aorta is going to embolize bilaterally. So when you monitor uh, the blood vessels in the brain bilaterally, and you see those embolization bilateral, you're thinking about more cardiac source and aortic source. Why during the bilateral embolization, you see only unilateral embolization that will be only from the middle cerebral artery related to that carotid embolization. So those are the differentiation how I would use uh, the TCD to look for the source uh, of the embolization. But again, the spontaneous embolization detection is something, again, uh, the fourth uh, uh, billing code in our TCD uh, uh, chart. And uh, that's also, um, I would say, really easy to do with a, a head frame placed on the head. And these days we're also using the uh, robotic uh, pro placement and uh, you can definitely use the robot to uh, find those middle cerebral artery as well. What do different mean velocity of the MC tell you? Uh, well, uh, the mean flow velocity in the MCA is normal. 
let's see, as your speed limit between 20 and 80. Uh, if you're younger, uh, if your patient is like younger, 30 to 40, uh, your endos, uh, the uh, mean flow velocity would be on a higher end, so 70s. If you have an 80 years old patient, the mean normal mean flow velocity would be in the 30s and 40s. So I would say that there's a, a mean flow velocity, we have a certain age limit that what's normal. Um, uh, usually we say that uh, the mean flow velocity for the MC is 50 plus minus 12. So that would be our normal range if you want to narrow it down for more uh, normal velocities. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize is that your mean flow velocity is normal, but the shape of the waveform changed. So when we played that we compress the common carotid artery or the internal carotid artery occlusion, you have a normal mean flow velocity, but your shape of the waveform is different. So you have to use the positively index as a second number to your mean flow velocities. You really see the value uh, of that MCA. So PI give you how much positivity you have. If you have uh, a post-anotic MCA, that PI value is 0.6 or lower. If you have a positivity index uh, over 1.2, the same mean flow velocity means that the mean flow velocity is fine, but your positivity is increased and you may have a chronic hypertension or you may have an increased ICP. So the mean flow velocity is number one, uh, a focal velocity increase, what you're looking for in a MCA to confirm a vasospasm or a focal uh, narrowing of the middle cerebral artery. Um, and the third one, you're looking at the MCA velocity as a confirmation of any carotid disease. So those are the three function how I'm looking for the middle cerebral artery mean flow velocity. And I had the last one, when you have an MCA obstruction, an M1, my mean flow velocity is definitely less than 20. So if I have a mean flow velocity significantly different between the two sides, again, I am looking for some hemospheric index, uh, let's say more than 40% difference. But if my mean flow velocity is less than 20, then um, I definitely think uh, we can uh, consider that uh, maybe uh, a distal obstruction in MCA. So I hope I answered your questions. If not, please uh, ask a specific clarification that mean flow velocity. Can you talk about uh, four acoustic windows? Uh, four. So number four acoustic windows. Um, I'm suspicious that uh, you are picking something on the forehead, but uh, so we have uh, acoustic windows um, through the eye. This is my ophthalmic. I'm going to increase my power. Uh, the temporal uh, bone windows, uh, this is um, again the best acoustic bone, uh, bone window and if you see, um, if you feel uh, front of the ear there's a dent and if you put your finger, this is exactly like your fingerprint uh, able to get you the probably the best window but anywhere between your eyes and the ear there's an acoustic uh, window that you can find, the middle cerebral artery. Uh, this is my best, uh, I call a posterior window. If I don't find a signal here angling anteriorly and up, I will come more anteriorly. Uh, one of my hint is that even if I don't find an MCA and angle back and I'm going to find a PCA almost 100% of the time, uh, maybe it's a, a bone matrix or something that makes it difficult sometimes to uh, really find these. Uh, we believe that uh, especially ladies, when we are getting older, there are some air pockets build up uh, during this osteoporosis and those air pockets are really what blocking my uh, acoustic uh, uh, signals. Uh, my third one is uh, the vertebral basilar, the suboccipital, or through the foramen magnum, I can see the vertebral basilar. The fourth uh, is again underneath uh, the submandibular. This is a external uh, internal carotid artery. We use that for the vasospasm uh, uh, um, index because the Lindegard ratio is the highest velocity of MCA divided by the submandibular ICA. So this is your fourth acoustic window, but I'm really not counting as acoustic window. If you really want a fourth acoustic window, is basically a forehead. The, especially young kids, uh, you can just put a probe and you're able to see uh, through the uh, uh, frontal lobe as well. Um, the next question, in your many years of experience, can you give one example of common mistake to watch out for? 
Ooh, yes. Um, if I can switch really fast, and can you don't show my laptop yet? I need to go out uh, really fast to. <laughs> Uh, because I do have a beautiful slideshow for my mistakes and uh, just give me a second and I am going to proudly show one of my favorite mistake uh, okay you can show my laptop uh, my setting is that I'm in, I'm in the ICU and I'm uh, doing a TCD on my patient and this is what I see. My probe is on the right eye and I don't see ophthalmic, I don't see nothing. So my first reaction is, oh my God, this whole carotid is occluded and um, suddenly um, I need to see a carotid duplex, so I called for a stat carotid ultrasound. And I remember, I think Esther came and did it and looked at me with a big question that this is an open carotid, uh, why don't see the eye? So then I'm looking at the seat a little bit closer. Guess what? There's an artificial uh, glass eye on that side. So again, my signal, and I would say it's not common, I did it once and I learned from it, that you cannot insonate uh, through an, a um, glass eye because you're going to, um, again, uh, not see anything, but it doesn't mean that this carotid is occluded. So this is uh, one of my favorite mistakes, I have to admit. And uh, this is, I think, uh, uh, another Esther special. So what you see is uh, through the eye, a right siphon give me a mean flow velocity is 140. So your probe um, is on the eyeball. Can you show my uh, hand, please, on the camera? So basically, your probe is uh, on the patient closed eyelid, and the probe is insonating the eye and you see the 140 and you say, this is a siphon uh, by the depth of 65 and this is a siphon stenosis. So you look at your MR and say, hmm, the siphon doesn't have a stenosis, but the MCA does. And through the eye, if you are not insulating with a 15 degree angle, but you're going straight, you have a beautiful middle cerebral artery. So again, this is one more thing uh, to consider <laughs> insonation if you can get it through the temporal bone window. But this is another beauty of uh, um, how the direction of the probe can mistakenly identify a different vessel. We got lucky because in this case we identified the stenosis, but you misidentify the vessel. Uh, so I think uh, this is... Uh, my second one, and uh, let me see if I have more common mistake for you. I think uh, I have to admit one more. I think the vertebral basilar system. So when you look at the vertebral basilar system, uh, you uh, are insulating uh, uh, very, very close to the two vertebral arteries. Mm -hmm. So let's say that your probe is in the suboccipital area and you're insonating the vertebral and you see an extremely high stenosis and uh, you assume that it's coming from this side. This tool, you, I did not change the scale, so you really appreciate that this mean flow velocity from endoscopic of 200 drops to that tiny small flow. So with this drop to the tiny flow pattern, you assume that this is the same side. So I think that's the problem when you're sampling with these nine, um, or this one is uh, three millimeters, but the size of the vessels are also like really tiny, two, three millimeters. So you can cross insonate because these two vertebrals are so close here, especially at the intracranial portion, that you can misidentify one vertebral versus other vertebral. So if the TCD does that mistake, um, I would definitely see that uh, you, I would prefer use a duplex for this case. So the duplex kind of give me both vertebral on one shot. So the du uh, duplex uh, give you my stenosis in this area and you see that is where exactly extracranial vertebral turns around and the skull entrance, that is where you see that uh, flow disturbance and this is a dilated part right there. 
and the increase velocity is the same what you saw on the TCD confirmed and is 200. And I think that's another cute example of showing it doesn't matter if you use a duplex or a TCD, they're both going to give you the same velocity. Uh, just do not angle correct. So these are uh, not angle corrected. Uh, uh, you can see there's a straight um, uh, sample uh, right here and uh, with no angle correction you're going to get the same velocity on the duplex as, as on the TCD. I think the M mode flow gap here in systole going to show you, we pinpoint you where that stenosis is really. Uh, Perfect. You answered my question. Thank you for your wealth of knowledge. Oh, thank you so much for the questions. And, you know, guys, I think uh, uh, we had a perfect year. And um, I wish everybody Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And please join us uh, next year. Um, I do not see any more questions. And thank you so much for uh, being a great audience. Uh, this is why we keep uh, doing our education. And thank you for listening and joining us. Uh, happy holidays. Bye-bye.